My first lecture this morning is going to be more about motivations and scope for representation learning and deep learning than most of the uh, uh, slides actually are on algorithms and um, since RVMs presumably have been mostly covered, I will probably go quickly and I'll talk about autoencoder variants and have later some uh, discussions about issues, questions, uh, practical uh, guidelines. And then um, probably on the last lecture on Friday, I'll talk about um, natural language processing applications and uh, a little uh, short topic uh, on a relationship between the evolution of culture and local minima and deep learning. So for my slides, you can find them at the URL uh, below. I don't know if all of you can see that. It's, uh, if you go um, www.iro.umontreal.ca, which is my department, slash tilde benjo y, it's my homepage, slash talks, and then uh, there are a bunch of things there. Deep learning gss2012.html has um, the slides and it has the slides as PDF as one big block, but that's like huge 48 meg file. So uh, they're also broken in seven parts, I think, which is probably uh, better for the survival of the network here. Okay, um, there's also a, um, well, there are a few papers you'll find on my webpage, uh, quite a few, but there's one that, um, I wrote recently, which covers a lot of the basic material in a kind of a review way, um, called Unsupervised Feature Learning and Deep Learning, a Review and New Perspectives that I wrote with uh, Aaron Corville and Pascal Vincent. All right, so let's uh, start with the real business. So my goal is to get us to AI. Of course, I'm not gonna do that alone, and I need you guys. And uh, I think it's a really interesting and fascinating goal, which has been kind of forgotten in the machine learning area in the last 10 years, where people have moved more towards uh, um, sort of more analytic understanding of things and, and more applications in, in industry. There's a lot of demand for machine learning. But I think the original goal of uh, reaching AI is really uh, important and, and fun. How do we get AI? Uh, well, an intelligent machine needs knowledge about the world around us. That's basically what it means to be intelligent, it, it have knowledge and being able to use it. In other words, having an operational form of knowledge. And how do you get that knowledge? Well, you can either put it in uh, explicitly or you can learn it. And uh, there's only so much we've been able uh, in terms of giving knowledge to machine by feeding, spoon feeding them knowledge, so learning is essential. And uh, how we get learning to work? Well, what is learning? Learning is about generalization and it's about, well, there are many ways to define what it means, but the way I like to think about it, and, and, and I know this is very sort of basic material for most of you, but, but uh, uh, keep that in mind as we move forward and some of the ideas that uh, I'll talk about during the week. Um, I'm thinking of, of learning as taking probability mass from the training examples and somehow guessing where to put it elsewhere. Um, and that means using some kind of uh, uh, preconceived idea about where to put the probability mass using some priors, but hopefully we can use very generic priors, the kind of priors you could imagine humans have used to make sense of the world around them. Uh, one of the sort of uh, one of the things that turns up in um, in this endeavor is the curse of dimensionality, and now I'll, I'll talk about that and uh, how some of these priors, like those you find in deep learning, uh, could help us fight the curse of dimensionality. And one of the big sort of basic goals that I've set myself, uh, that I set for myself, is to to uh, come up with algorithms that somehow manage to, to some, as much as possible, disentangle the underlying explanatory factors that are behind the data 
In other words, making sense of the data in, in the real sense. All right, so deep learning is a, a particular form of representation learning, and, and a lot of the things that you've heard and I'll be talking about uh, also this week are about representation learning. So representation learning, what is that? Um, one simple way to, of thinking about it is um, to learn good features. It turns out that when you apply machine learning in the real world, and I've done a lot of that in my lab with uh, industrial contracts and things like that, um, you really need good features. So a lot of machine learning is uh, failing if you don't give, them, give the algorithms the right features. So it wouldn't be great if we could uh, use a bit more learning on the side of the features rather than having to um, handcraft them. I'm sure Andrew Ng gave you a lot of speech about that. Um, so there is another way to think about um, representation learning. What, what is a good representation? So in a probabilistic setting, you can think of a good representation as one that tells you about the underlying explanatory causes for the current input. So more formally, it gives you something about the posterior belief given your input about those causes. And in a way that can, you know, you, you can, you can somehow, somehow use that information, disentangles these factors. Well, the problem is we don't know what the right causes is. I mean, in, in some settings we can have enough prior knowledge, but in general we don't. So we'd like the learner to figure out what those factors are and then using some kind of inference or prediction that tells us what those factor values or posterior distribution should be. So that's one way to think about representation learning. Now, deep learning is a form of representation learning with a twist um, that there are multiple levels of representation and, and these are presumably organized in levels of different complexity and abstraction in a kind of hierarchy uh, and we'll come back to that, of course. But there's, there's an important uh, point that hasn't been made a lot about what I, what, I should, what I think we should reserve the world deep learning for or deep architecture is when the number of levels in this uh, uh, hierarchy can be data selected. In other words, it's not that uh, there's a particular fixed number of levels, like three, we can say, oh, that's deep learning. It's more like I'm using this somehow the same generic uh, learning algorithm for all my levels. And, and so I could have one, two, three, four, five, depending on what the data tells me is, is appropriate. OK, so I guess you've seen these kinds of pictures before. Input layers, hidden layers, uh, output layers. That's a good old neural net. Um, curse of dimensionality. OK, so uh, um, I'm also guessing you've seen a bit of that before. But the idea is, and uh, uh, if there's only one factor, say, and it can take only so many values you care to distinguish, so you can maybe break up these values in different intervals, and you want to learn a function that depends on where you are on that scale, um, then if you have enough examples to cover the different intervals that you care about, uh, you can learn the function of interest. If you have two factors that matter, maybe there are more configurations that you want to distinguish, and uh, you need now more examples to cover the different configurations, and if you have three and so on, it, it grows exponentially with the number of factors that you need to distinguish. So you can see how this blows up exponentially. Um, and that's because I've been assuming that in order to generalize to a new location, I need examples in that neighborhood that tell me what the answer should be, which is, of course, the, an easy kind of learning. Uh, but we want to do something that's going to be better in a sense that we'll be able to generalize non-locally to places we haven't seen any, configura any configurations of the input. So one sort of the, the classical way, ways around that is, well, uh, cross your fingers. In other words, uh, assume that the number of factors of interest is small and, and the function you will learn is smooth. You notice that if the function, what, saying the function is smooth means I don't need to have so many intervals, right? And not so many factors mean obviously there are less configurations. And it uh, turns out you, you can get both of these things if you handcraft good features. And that's why handcrafting features is so important. 
and we want to, why we want to get around it. So let's get back to really, really basics of machine learning. What is it we're trying to do? So let's consider the very, very simple case of learning a continuous value y given x. So I, I give you x, y pairs, and you want to predict y given x. So what, what many learning algorithms do is just a form of interpolation. Now, you can call it something very sophisticated, like a kernel machine with uh, Hilbert space, blah, blah, blah. But in the end, many of the things we do is just some kind of smart interpolation. So for example, the dashed line here could be obtained by some kind of interpolation between the, the green examples. Now, I'm calling it easy here because you notice that I have enough examples to cover all the ups and downs that I care about from that function. And that's what allows me to generalize in this setting uh, reasonably well. It's because I'm, I'm exploiting a prior which says that the output, the, the, the function I want to predict uh, at some point x is not too far from the value of uh, uh, some, from the value of the function at nearby points, such as the training examples, and, and I can be a bit smart by looking at a few neighbors and interpolating one way or another. So that's good enough in, in simple cases, but it's not good enough for AI because the real world is uh, highly curved and has a lot of variations. So I, I gave uh, this example. Um, so th there's th the previous example was in supervised learning, but there's an unsupervised learning case where you assume that your data concentrates on a manifold. So this is the idea of manifold learning, and I'll be getting back to that several times. And here the picture shows a digit four which on a two-dimensional manifold can be uh, modified by, changed by some, say, rotation and shrinking. So you have these two axes. In general, you can have more axes, but, but typically you can imagine like the number of factors of variation for just a geometry of uh, an object is small, like six, seven, eight, or something. Um, now, things are unfortunately more complicated because, first of all, even if the number of dimensions is small, the curvature, the, the manifold is not that smooth. In fact, you can, you can show very nice examples that when your images are discretized into pixels, it's, uh, the, uh, the manifold has a uh, very strong uh, curvature, so it, it's not at all smooth. And of course, the other problem is the real objects don't have just six or seven degrees of freedom, and there are many of them together in the same image, like in a scene or uh, something you hear. And so the combinatorics of all the possible changes is now a completely uh, overwhelming, simple local learning methods. So in fact, uh, one thing that uh, I realized a few years ago, and it's kind of uh, uh, explained in detail in this paper, I think it's a NIPS paper, is it's not so much the number of dimensions that hurts uh, machine learning. It's the number of variations that you're trying to capture. So it could be a one-dimensional problem, but if, if the number of variations of the function you want to learn is large, then with a simple local learning method based on the smoothness prior, uh, you, you're going to need a number of examples that's proportional to the number of ups and downs, the number of zero crossings. Uh, and, and, and because of this, you can prove things about learning algorithms like Gaussian kernel machines that rely on local generalization. Uh, you, can, you can say things like um, that the number of uh, examples you would need might go exponentially with the dimension, but, but more generally it's the number of ups and downs. So that's, that's the thing to keep in mind. So if we use only the, the, this local smoothness prior, which is behind, as I said, most of machine learning, um, there's only so far we can go. So is there any hope to be able to generalize, to say something far from your training examples, in other words, non-locally? And, and the answer is yes, but we won't get it out of thin air. You need some kind of priors. So along my presentation this morning, I'll be uh, introducing some of these priors, and maybe others uh, will show up uh, later in future research. So uh, why deep learning and representation learning? So I guess you've, you've been told this already, so I'm going to go quickly. So we want to learn features, not handcraft them. 
Um, one reason is that handcrafted features are nice, but they're often brittle, incomplete, and of course it's very time consuming. Uh, the thing about AI, it's, it's, it's a lot of knowledge. So if we have to do it all by hand, put in all the knowledge by hand, it's gonna be uh, difficult. It would be much uh, more efficient if uh, the machine can do most of the work. Okay, so yeah, I said that. Okay, so that part is really important. Now, now please pay attention. This, the next three slides are really worth it if you haven't really captured that concept already. And it's about uh, a kind of geometric argument why you want distributed representations, the kinds of representations that you find in deep learning. And why a lot of the basic, a lot of the learning algorithms we have in machine learning um, are kind of doomed uh, in some sense. It's connected to the, curse, to the curse of dimensionality I was talking about earlier. So basically I'm gonna distinguish two kinds of learning algorithms. There's one kind which is like clustering uh, on this slide and then in the next slide I'll show something about distributed representation like RBMs and, and factor models and I call that multi-clustering. So let's start with clustering. So a lot of algorithms, whether they are unsupervised like clustering or supervised like nearest neighbor or um, many kernel machines, um, the way they work really if you abstract out and take some distance is just taking the input space and breaking it up in regions so that you'll be able to have uh, a different kind of answer in each region. And maybe you can interpolate between the regions like if you have a Gaussian mixture model, for example, is kind of smooth interpolation between the regions. And the regions can be like the Voronoi kinds that you find in, in clustering or in nearest neighbors, uh, or it could be like uh, broken by, uh, you know, piecewise linear uh, half planes, like in decision trees. But whatever the way you break up the input space, the important characteristic of, of this family of learning algorithms is is this, that the number of distinguishable regions grows linearly with the number of parameters. So here you see, for example, in, in, in these kinds of algorithms, the way you would learn is you would need some examples to tell you, like, you know, you need a prototype for the center of the region, or you need some parameter that tells you what the output should be in that region. Uh, so you need both a way to uh, define well, what the region should be and what the function you want to learn should be in that region somehow and you specify that with some free parameters. So you can see clearly that the number of distinguishable regions and the number of parameters are connected linearly. Okay, so that's one kind of learning algorithms. The other kind is this. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna again play the game of breaking up the input space in different regions, but somehow we're gonna do it in a way that the number of distinguishable regions is gonna grow very quickly, something like exponentially, with the number of parameters. And you can see that would be statistically really nice because uh, as, as you may know from basic machine learning theory, the number of, um, of examples you need for getting a certain level of generalization depends on the number of degrees of freedom or VC dimension or you know, simple-mindedly number of parameters. So we would really like to be able to generalize to a number of regions much larger than number of parameters. For one thing, we, as we're gonna see, it's gonna allow us to generalize to regions for which we haven't seen any examples. I could also replace that by number of distinguishable regions grows almost exponentially with number of examples. So I'm able to say something about uh, places I've never seen, and exponentially more places. Okay, so how can we possibly get that? You'd think, when you look at this picture, you'd think that's the only way you could ever generalize. You know, well, I want to learn a function, so I have to figure out what the value of the function is in different places, and that's it. What else is there? Well, here's another option. Um, so like in an RBM, or in a factor model, or a neural net, uh, one layer thing, uh, each hidden unit, uh, you can think of it as a linear classifier that breaks up the input space in two parts. So like the, the blue hyperplane here has a region where 
uh, c2 equals 1 and uh, a region where c2 equals 0. So one sign and the other sign. And each of these three linear classifiers outputs a bit or can compute a bit or is associated to a bit that tells you on which side of the hyperplane you are. So now you can just see how many regions are there. It's, the regions are not mutually exclusive. Like in this picture, the reason uh, I, I needed so many uh, parameters and regions uh, for the number of regions is that I, I had different parameters for each region. Here, I don't have different parameters for each region. I have shared parameters. And it's the intersection of these half planes which give me the regions. So there's this extra twist here. Um, so now it's all the possible configurations of those bits that tell me in which region I am. So you can, you can see why you're going to get a lot more regions in this way. OK, so instead of trying to break, like in the case of clustering, instead of breaking up the input in different mutually exclusive categories, Imagine what you're doing here is you're inventing some attributes and, and an input is represented by the configuration of these attributes. So th maybe one of these is uh, male versus female and this one is tall versus short and this one is uh, uh, you know, brown versus uh, beige or something. And uh, it's all these configurations that give rise to the different input configurations you can distinguish in this way. And you'll be able to say something about a region you have never seen any example because you've previously seen some examples of being on that side of this one, and you've seen some examples of being on that side of that one, and, and same thing for this other one. And why is this, you know, what's the magic? I mean, why would this be exponentially more powerful? It's because there's a prior. You're assuming that the real world can be described by these attributes that it makes sense to generalize. Once you know, you know the distinction between male and female, there's something about male and female that continues to be true besides you know, whether it's a short or a tall female. And it's because there's you know, some kind of, uh, these are really different explanatory factors. That's the story. And the truth is that the world around us has these explanatory factors. They're not necessarily completely independent, but somehow they can be varied separately or uh, you can sometimes even control them separately. Um, and so th there is, they really exist. So that's the prior, that there are some, some factors that can somehow vary separately and that you can figure out what they mean without having to look at all the configurations of the different factors. Now, in this picture, you notice that the, the factors are supposed to be linear defined by linear classifiers, like you know, male, female, as I was saying. But Presumably, if your input is images, you won't be able to say it's a male or a female just by a linear classifier. And that's one of the reasons you want deep learning, because you, you want to learn about factors that are not just directly linear in input space, but somehow can be complicated curves here if you, wanna, if you think of them as binary indicators. Please interrupt me at any time during the lectures uh, and the end, of course. Uh, I think it's, it's more pedagogical if, if you guys don't hesitate and I can answer on the fly. So is this clear? Great. Um, so that's the same thing, I guess. Another motivation for representation learning and deep learning is that a lot of these algorithms can be com potentially completely unsupervised, uh, which means they don't need hand-labeled uh, data. And the problem is uh, with hand-labeled data is that we only have always limited amount of it, but we have tons of unlabeled data. So it would be nice from a practical point of view if we have algorithms that can learn mostly from, from unlabeled data. Um, presumably, the brain also mostly learns in an unsupervised way. Of course, there's reinforcement signals, and of course, the, you can even think of some supervision when uh, you, someone tells you what you should have done, but it's pretty rare. Most of the information we get from the outside world is completely unlabeled in some sense. You don't, you don't get a feedback for every single uh, per set that comes to your mind, to your, to your brain. Um, right, so the most, most of the instance in your life um, are unlabeled and you have tons of parameters to set. Um, so probably comes from unsupervised learning. Um, this is also connected to uh, a big riddle 
that people have uh, had in machine learning, comparing machine learning algorithms to human learning. So we humans and even animals in some settings uh, can learn really quickly a new task from even one or two examples in some cases. So how could we possibly manage to do that? Uh, I mean, we know like our machine learning algorithms need thousands of examples to do anything decent. It's because we are able to transfer knowledge from previous learning. In other words, um, if you already know most that there is to know about the distribution and you, you, you have these two clusters, for example, in your representation of the input, and, and I just give you, I guess I'll have a picture of that here. So this is the way you learn uh, in a purely supervised fashion. And you know, these are the labeled examples and these are unlabeled. So if, if you have lots of unlabeled examples and I just give you these two labeled examples, you can, you can figure out what the good decision boundary should be much better than if, I, if you didn't take these into account. And it's because you figure out the input distribution, you figure out that it was concentrated in these two regions. And so it was, you, then you don't need a lot of examples to do a good job of, of uh, supervised learning. Right. Um, and so there is a prior, again, so you'll see there are these priors that are kind of generic I've been talking about. This is, this, now this is the second one, which is that um, the world around us has these explanatory factors and um, among other things, they're shared between the input distribution and some task uh, conditional distribution. So let's say you want to predict y given x, so that's like one task. And you also have access to unlabeled examples from a distribution p of x. So if you think of these as two functions of x, uh, basically I'm saying these two functions of x have something in common. And what they have in common is that the underlying factors that explain the variations here and those that explain the variations here have something in common. There's probably, in fact, a subset of these guys which is sufficient for doing this task. In general, for a particular task, you only care about some subset of, of factors. In fact, why you can think of as one of the factors. Okay, we've done that. Um, all right, so, so depth, uh, we're gonna talk more about that. Um, there is a, a number of results now that suggest that if you're, if you're gonna represent your model or your function um, through a deep architecture with multiple levels of representation, um, then you can hope in some cases to have an exponential gain meaning that the representing the same function can be done much more efficiently in terms of number of computations, number of parameters, number of units of, of uh, computation. Uh, and I'll give a bit of example of that later. Um, and of course there's all the biological inspiration as you probably heard uh, already last week. Um, and there's some cognitive uh, motivation as well. Um, we, we don't learn things in, in one go, especially complicated things. We actually learn in a, in a sequential way more complicated things on top of simpler things. And that's also the way we organize knowledge, by the way. Uh, if you look at a dictionary or uh, a curriculum um, uh, in any uh, area of knowledge. So here's a kind of a intuitive example to see why you could get a, an exponential gain from having a deeper representations. So this example is in a very simple mathematical domain, which is the domain of polynomials. And we're interested in representing polynomials. We can represent polynomials, as you know, as a two-level circuit with sums and products, where you just uh, have all of the factors in the first layer and then you sum them up in the second layer. So that's uh, the usual um, sum of product representation of, of, of polynomials. But you could also have, represent a polynomial with a deeper circuit that has sum and products with many levels of sums and products. That's called a sum product network. 
And, um, and now you can ask yourself, well, is there any advantage to representing a polynomial with a deeper circuit? We know with two we can represent anything. In fact, this is true not just for polynomials. As you may know, like regular neural networks with a single hidden layer can represent any function to some degree of approximation, um, con continuous functions, um, and, and things like um, SVMs basically corresponding to two levels can represent any function to some degree of approximation as well. I mean, kernel SVMs and, and, and so on. And, and, uh, and or uh, circuits can represent any Boolean function with just two levels. Oh, it's always more or less the same story. In fact, it's more, mostly sums of products. Um, but you can also use more levels. And why would that be advantageous? So. Think about this polynomial. So these x1, x2 here are just scalars, and every number here is a scalar, or you can think of it as a function associated with the sums and products in the subtree rooted there, or subgraph rooted there, rather. Um, so for example, here we compute x2, x3, and somehow it's, it's used, it's reused in here in these two places, and then it can be reused in more places higher up. And what you notice is that the factor x2, x3 um, shows up in parts of the factors that are uh, in higher level polynomials corresponding to nodes deeper in the graph. And the number of times it's going to show up uh, essentially depends exponentially on the depth between here and here because it depends on the number of paths that go from here to here. Um, and, and that's it, right? So because we have many ways of recombining and reusing pieces, and the, the number of such ways grows exponentially, if you have a deeper representation, you can potentially um, represent the same thing, but more compactly, because you can take advantage of the reuse that the, the function you're trying to learn has. Of course, not all functions will have the property that you can factor them in this way. You can think of them as a factorization, as a way to break up the function in a more compact form. But it's again, it's a prior, right? That there is there are building blocks that you can combine at many levels, and um, if, if the world is organized in that way, then there's a potential exponential gain. What This is what this is saying. Um, so I'm sure Andrew showed you this picture, uh, which is very intuitive, showing uh, this idea of reusing parts to combine objects. Um, so uh, maybe your first layer uh, discovers gavel filters, and then these can be combined to um, uh, find features that um, uh, recognize parts, and then these parts can be combined to full objects and so on. One thing he probably didn't mention is uh, you can get this kind of compos compositionality um, in um, sort of different ways that are interesting when you think about natural language processing and how human thought may be organized using uh, so-called recurrent neural nets and recursive neural nets. So uh, let's start with recurrent nets. The idea is I have an input sequence and I'm going to produce a sequence of internal representations. So you can think of that as a, a big deep network except the, um, each layer, this is like a layer mapping the previous state to the next state, uh, each layer has the same parameters. And you can think of the, this as the unfolding in time of the computation of a, like a, a network that has self-connections. In other words, think of these as neurons. Their outputs depend on the same neurons at t minus 1 and the input at t minus 1. Uh, and then if you want to predict something, you might have other parameters you know, shooting out from here, going to your predictions or your actions. But the important thing is uh, this state now will be a, a complicated nonlinear function of all the previous inputs. And it, 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 you could learn parameters so that this will summarize the previous inputs, uh, maybe for the purpose of predicting the next one or whatever. Recursive uh, neural networks are um, in the same spirit, except that instead of having a linear chain, you could have some kind of graph or tree, a directed asynchronous graph. And for example, you could use this for parsing, as we'll see later. Uh, but there's this idea of uh, recursion. In other words, we're going to reuse the same piece of circuitry um, in a kind of um, way that uh, composes sort of 
parts of summarization of previous data into sort of higher level um, things. So we'll get back to that later, I guess at the end of the week. Um, and and one, way to, uh, one thing to realize is that once you unfold, in other words, you, you, you draw things like this, uh, you see that these can be pretty deep. In fact, especially the recurrent networks, they are as deep as the length of the sequences on which you apply them. So that could be like 30, 50, or 100, a lot more than we used to when we, we look at deep nets. Another motivation is multitask learning. Um, so if we really want to tackle AI, it's, it's going to mean more than one very specialized task as we usually do machine learning. I mean, machine learning typically is looking at with, with uh, uh, you know, just one very small piece of the world um, on which we want to predict something. But uh, for real AI, it's going to be understanding a lot more about the world. So um, we want approaches that uh, allow to generalize across tasks. Even if you have little data for a new task, you'll be able to generalize. And, and one interesting idea is that if we learn representations, so this is an input and maybe you can predict different things for different tasks, maybe you can share some of the representations for different tasks. And why would that make sense? Well, it's connected to this uh, idea again that the world around us is explained by these underlying, these hidden factors. So if these underlying factors um, explain a lot of what we see in the world, they probably also explain uh, you know, what matters for these different tasks. And the prior is that there is some sharing, that the same, there's a subset of factors that's relevant to each task. Um, and, and they all sort of share from the same pool. So that's another prior. Another sort of connected ideas with this multitask learning is um, the idea of combining multiple sources of, of evidence, multiple sources of data, which you can naturally do, do once you introduce in machine learning the idea of sharing representations. So the traditional machine learning approach is someone gives you data, and the data you can think of as a big matrix. Uh, well, here we have two matrices, but typically you have one matrix where each row is an example and each column is a variable. OK, that's nice, but um, in the real world, often we have multiple sort of sources of data. Maybe I have data coming from, uh, what is this, uh, people uh, doing things at some pages. And this is about uh, what, is our, what is on these pages. So you have different sources, and, and they really could be of very different sizes and involve different variables. But some of the variables could be shared, like the URL here shows up in, in these two tables. And now we're entered the realm of relational learning, like in relational databases. The way real databases are organized is just not one table. It's usually, usually many tables. So we'd like machine learning to, to work in that setting as well. And that's also a setting where uh, you know, humans are able to consider different types of problems, different types of data, and integrate them all uh, in some kind of shared model. So the way we can get some of that integration is by sharing representations of the same types, the same types of variables that occur uh, in different of these uh, different um, data sources, different um, matrices. So here's a little picture to explain what I mean. Uh, let's say that for each of these data sets, I build a different model. So in general, maybe it's a model of the joint, but it could be a model of some conditional or whatever. Um, but in general, machine learning, you know, in the most general cases, just learning the joint between all the things you observe. Uh, but now, the function I'm going to learn, I'm going to decompose it into a part which is how do I represent each of the variable? So that I, I mean here like mapping the event attributes or event ID to some representation and mapping the URL to some representation and mapping the person ID or person attributes to some representation and then having some shared, I mean not shared, I mean some uh, some computation with some parameters that give me the function I want. But the point is now I can share this part of this model with this part of this model because URL shows up in these two tables. 
And so because I'm in this framework of learning representations for the objects that I'm looking at, I can reuse these representations across different um, data sources. And we actually actually done things like that in recent work with uh, onto one board. Um, some of the sources would be things like WordNet, um, extended WordNet, which are particular sentences, um, like dictionary definitions, Wikipedia, Freebase, ImageNet. Um, and uh, a kind of interesting example of something uh, related uh, is when you have multiple um, modalities, like text and images, and not only you learn a representation for, say, words, and you learn a representation for images, but you, it could be very interesting to think of a shared space where images are mapped and where words are mapped, uh, maybe such that in that space, uh, you know, uh, the word dolphin will be close to the images for dolphin. And if you had such a set of representations, of course, you could see immediately how you could take advantage of that uh, if you were Google, for example, to do uh, image search, which is, I'm sure, what they're doing. At least that's what the papers they publish are about. Um, the sixth point is about invariance and disentangling the factors of variation. So we've talked about these factors in many uh, slides. And uh, as I said, what we really would like, so the ultimate goal, is to discover what these factors are and somehow separate them out. But we don't know a priori what they look like. Um, in, in machine vision, and uh, to some extent also in things like speech recognition, there is this uh, strong idea that we should do machine learning that extracts machine learning or feature engineering that extract uh, invariant representations, invariant features. What, what do they mean? What they mean is that some of the factors we care about and others we don't. Like, let's say I'm doing speech recognition, and two of the main factors are what are the phonemes that are being pronounced and who's the person pronouncing them. And of course, there are other factors like what kind of microphone and what kind of noise conditions. And if you're doing speech recognition, then all of the factors except uh, the phonemes uh, matter. And so you'd, you'd like to have features that are invariant to all of the factors you don't care about, like the microphone. Maybe you want to do some pre-processing to try to get uh, eliminate some of the variations, like just the amplitude, the energy level. Uh, some of the noise. Uh, in, in, in vision, maybe you want to get rid of uh, um, translations. Uh, so for example, if you take the Fourier transform of uh, some signals, you can get a translation invariant representation right, if you take the amplitude of the spectrum. So uh, people have been doing a lot of thinking about how could I get features that are invariant with respect to specific factors of variation, which I want to get rid of because my, in my task, I really care about uh, something else. And as, of course, remember with the curse of dimensionality, this really matters because the, the more factors sort of combine in a complicated way and the more difficult it's going to be to, to model. So if I can eliminate some of the factors, uh, that's great. The problem is uh, in sort of the setting, in my setting, where I say, well, I want to solve AI, uh, no one tells me what the factors are and, um, or I, I, not all of them anyway. So I'd like to be able to discover what they are. Um, so, and, and also I want to do unsupervised learning. So if you're doing unsupervised learning, it's not like there is a good factor and a bad factor. So if I'm listening to speech, well, maybe one day I want to do speech recognition and the other day I want, I want to do speech speaker recognition. So that's a different factor altogether. I, and I don't know ahead of time when I'm doing unsupervised learning which task is going to be important. So what I really want to do is to disentangle those factors to actually find them out in the data and separate them out. If I could, then you could see that uh, then solving a specific task would be easy because I would just need to figure out which of my features are useful and, um, and uh, that would also deal with the curse of dimensionality. Now, there's an interesting empirical observation with deep learning. Um, uh, somehow, uh, these algorithms we've been playing with, like uh, I guess these were sparse autoencoders, and these are sparse autoencoders as well, uh, rectified denoising autoencoders. Um, many of these algorithms, but I think it's true of RBMs and others as well, um, they, they seem to do without 
I mean, we don't understand why, but they seem to, to do a bit of that disentangling. Uh, so, for example, in, in an experiment published in 2009, uh, Jan Goodfellow and his collaborators found that um, in, in a vision task, some high-level features in their hierarchy were more invariant to geometric factors of variation than lower-level factors. It's not that they trained these features to do that, it just happened to be that the, the hidden units in their deep net tended to specialize to some factors, and so they were uh, less sensitive to other factors. And we've observed something similar on a natural language processing task, uh, where different features specialize with different aspects of the task, like the domain, is this about books or is this about uh, music, and the sentiment, was the sentence positive or negative? So how could that happen? Well, as we've seen in the two examples I've cited, which are in the, in the few that are in the literature, um, there was a um, sparsity involved um, in the picture somehow. So what is sparsity? Um, did, did you guys hear about sparsity? I'm sure you did, right? So I don't need to, to explain it. But what I want to say is that I have the intuition that somehow if you have a sparse representation, it helps to disentangle the information. Um, and um, I guess one way to convince yourself this is true is kind of uh, crooked, but if, imagine, imagine the, the real world was sparse, that uh, a good representation of your underlying factors was sparse, um, then if you applied some kind of dense compression, I mean, if you, if you apply compression, uh, so a sparse vector is, is usually large and has many zeros, so it's like a waste of information, and if you wanted to compress it, you could. Um, but if you did, that would entangle all of the factors. Right? So in a sense, trying to find a sparse representation is trying to do the opposite. And of course, there's the prior, the prior is, again, right, I'm a prior here, that only a few concepts and attributes are relevant for each particular example. Um, we also know that in the brain, there's about 1% of neurons that are active at a particular time, but maybe this, this is for other reasons, like energy efficiency. Um, but it makes sense, like if you think about a particular scene or a particular sentence, um, there are only a few of the, the many, many concepts that you know about that are relevant to talk about this scene or talk about this sentence. So it's, it's a reasonable prior. Um, it's the kind of general prior that uh, I, I like to introduce. It's not very task specific, but uh, that's the kind of thing with which we can hope to uh, deal with the curse of dimensionality. There are other advantages to having sparse representations. Um, so I'll explain this idea of a local chart later when I talk about um, autoencoders, I guess, um, may, maybe not today, um, maybe, maybe later, maybe tomorrow. Um, and um, another thing that some people like is, um, conceptually speaking, there, there's something about the traditional neural nets which is unsatisfying from even a cognitive point of view, and certainly for people in natural language processing, uh, trying to think about thought and language, um, or even in general, in computer science, uh, when we try to solve a problem, we use data structures. We use data structures that can typically have variable size, maybe because there are graphs or things like that. Um, but the, the point is, depending on your input, you, 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 you probably need a different number of bits to represent that input efficiently. Um, if you have a sparse representations, then you, know, you, you can have a few of the features that are active or a lot of features that are active depending on what's needed for the particular example. And, and somehow these can encode pretty complicated things because uh, maybe some bits should be interpreted in the context of other bits. And that's essentially what a data structure means. Okay. So uh, just a parenthesis here, we had an AI stats paper uh, um, in 2011 where we explored um, sparse representations for neural nets and autoencoders uh, and that follows up on um, stuff that Mayer and Hinton, uh, I don't know if Jeff uh, Hinton um, 
told you about some of the work they did with sparse um, RVMs. Um, but anyways, there is some biological sort of motivation to this uh, work. Um, this curve here shows the kind of uh, response that biological neurons have. So if you increase the input current, this is the firing rate. Firing rate. Um, so below some threshold, you get nothing, and then suddenly jumps and kind of saturates, but it's not like the sigmoid you're used to. And furthermore, um, neurons typically operate in this region, around the knee, and not so much here. If, if, if you're in this region, uh, the saturation region, uh, it's because you're, you're very sick, usually. Um, and so a reasonable approximation of this is just a simple rectifier. It turns out you can plug these rectifiers as nonlinear activation functions in the neural net, and that works incredibly well. And I used to think this shouldn't work. Uh, when, uh, when I was younger, I thought, well, backprop, uh, you need continuous smooth functions. Um, all your neurons you know, should have something like a sigmoid or a hyperbolic tangent so that the gradient can flow through. So what happens here? I mean, you have lots of hidden units that are going to be uh, inactive, so they're going to be in this region of the um, activation function where the, the, the weighted sum of their input is, is less than zero. And, uh, and so for these sort of units, they're going to be shut off. There's not going to be any gradient. The, the gradient is only going to flow through these active paths, um, the neurons that are active. But actually, maybe this is a good thing. In fact, what we found is that we can train really deep networks even without unsupervised pre-training, just because we use these rectifier um, units. So the, these actually give rise to real sparsity. So these are real zeros. It's not like the sigmoid is close to zero. Um, and you can get this amount of sparsity to be higher by uh, uh, having a, a L1 or other kind of penalty on the activations. Um, uh, so we had good results on that, and I'll let you look at the papers if you're interested. There's another uh, kind of hint um, that comes with a prior, um, wh which we can exploit to disentangle, and that's the temporal coherence prior, and, um, and also the sort of related prior that different factors operate at different time scales. So this prior makes sense when your data has a temporal structure, like a video or um, speech or music or uh, even texts. There are things in the world out there that don't change very rapidly. Like in, currently in, in this situation, there's, there are people in the room and you guys stay in the room, right? at least for a few seconds or minutes. And, and so all of my percepts come, and there's something, an explanatory variable, which is who's in the room, that remains the same. And if my brain can take advantage of these kinds of hints, I can, I can more easily figure out that the presence of particular people in the room is an important factor to explain what I'm seeing. So it looks obvious, but most of machine learning doesn't take advantage of the kind of hint. And if we're going to learn in a way to discover these underlying factors, and we should use these kinds of hints. These are very, very powerful hints. There are even some sort of theoretical results showing that you can, you can in a purely unsupervised way, thanks to temporal coherence, you can discover the, the existence of classes, for example. More generally, you can imagine that uh, the different explanatory factors uh, can change over time, but change at different, at different speeds, and some factors maybe change rapidly. You can think of uh, like the noise, uh, in, in speech, for example, um, others change more slowly, maybe more abstract characteristics of what is going on, uh, and more generally, different factors operate at different scales. So uh, I think that's a powerful hint that we can exploit, and there are some papers, I've cited a few papers here, uh, we did some work uh, a couple of years ago, but uh, some really older work uh, from Becker and Hinton. Um, all right, so this kind of, uh, we're approaching sort of the end of this motivation section and the end of the first hour. And um, one important message is that thanks to all these priors I've been talking about, uh, we, we maybe have a chance to bypass this curse of dimensionality or curse of uh, 
know, complexity of the number of variations we want to capture. And, um, and sort of one sort of cute idea <laughs> is that the curse of dimensionality has this exponential nature. And so you know, when, when you're attacked by an exponential, just use more exponentials to fight it, right? So it turns out that, uh, as I've been trying to argue, that if you use distributed representations, like in multi-clustering, or learning um, embeddings and features and so on, uh, you, can, you can have a, an exponential gain compared to uh, traditional methods based purely on the smoothness assumption and local representations. And so that's one exponential. Another exponential we get is by having multiple levels of representation. That's the deep architecture um, story. And in all of these cases, if you think about it, uh, what you're taking advantage of is some form of compositionality. Here we're composing different features together. And here we are also composing different features, but at different levels. So it's, it's you know, the, the exponential comes from the compositionality. And the compositionality is something is also, also something that really exists in the world around us. That's how the world is organized. At least we've found it really useful to, to organize it that way, and it works for us. So, so there's, um, I guess you, you've heard about um, like GPU implementations of deep learning and so on. And it's great because many of these algorithms can be implemented in, efficiently in hardware. Um, because they essentially do matrix multiplications and stuff like that. But, but the real advantage is, of these methods is, is deeper. The real advantage is statistical. It's that um, I think there are compelling arguments that if we have good algorithms for deep learning, then we, we have a good chance to move towards AI. And what that means is to be able to learn about the, the world around us from a reasonably small number of examples. So we don't need to see. 10 to the 20 examples before we, we get a grasp for, uh, of uh, you know, the things that humans take for granted. And this shows up, um, for example, in um, semi-supervised learning. So these priors that allow, give us this power uh, show up in, in, in semi-supervised learning, as I said, where you have lots of unlabeled examples. So for example, we've seen the power of unsupervised pre-training in some, in some uh, problems. Uh, we've also seen the advantages of these techniques in multitask learning, and I think I'll, I'll give a few examples in my lectures. Uh, and transfer learning, um, which I should have mentioned on that slide somewhere. Uh, Multi-data sharing, I, I've talked about that, so it's a kind of multitask learning as well. So why this summer school is so popular, and, and why is deep learning so uh, is so popular? It turns out I, I gave a deep learning tutorial at ICML a couple of weeks ago, and I gave a deep learning tutorial at ACL, which is a computational linguistics uh, conference, the major computational linguistics conference the last week. And here I am today. Uh, it's, it's because there's a lot of interest in these techniques. And um, uh, what, what happened? Uh, well, there's sort of empirical success, but I think more importantly, there are ideas. Um, there was a breakthrough a few years ago um, when we figured out that you could, you could do this unsupervised learning uh, of each layer of some kind of neural net, whereas uh, previously most of the neural net research has been focused on supervised learning. Um, and um, the main components, uh, these layer-wise training, you've heard about RBNs, what one quarter variants, sparse coding variants, uh, but uh, we can invent more. Um, so let me um, show you this little slide for the, I guess, one minute that's left. Last year in my lab, we participated in two um, international machine learning competitions. Um, one, I guess the first one, where the results were presented at ICML. The other one at NIPS six months later. And um, in both cases, uh, there are settings, essentially transfer learning. So these are transfer learning competitions. And in both settings, you have um, examples from one distribution. And then uh, you really want to learn representations from these examples so that you can apply those representations on slightly different tasks, maybe other classes, uh, for which you have very few labels. And so these graphs show 
you don't, you can't read here, but it says log of, of the number of training examples, and this is zero, which means one example uh, per class. And one means two, four, eight, so up to 16 examples per class. So this is very few examples. And what you show is a kind of a, here is a accuracy. So what you'd like is uh, something like this, where you need very few examples to nail the task. Afterwards, you, you know, basically uh, uh, reach the base error. And on this particular task, uh, you can see the power of increasing the number of layers from zero. Um, this is a linear classifier, one, two, three, four. Um, um, and so I'm quite proud of uh, my team of students who've been involved in these competitions. All right, let's uh, take a break now.